because this is my story. It is my story and not that of my sponsors, the Animas and One Touch. I'm an ex-international cyclist. I've raced for Scotland and Great Britain on many occasions. I broke Graham O'Brien's Scottish one-hour record in 1996, covering just under 30 miles in an hour. I represented Scotland in the 1994 Commonwealth Games in Canada, eh, finishing ninth in the road race. It was the first year that the Commonwealth Games was open to professional cyclists as well. So we were racing against guys that had just come out of the Tour de France. So that's me with the bumblebee glasses on in second place. And the guy in front of me is Phil Anderson, who was the first Australian to ever wear the yellow jersey in the Tour de France. I finished fourth overall in the Tour of Ireland twice, which is a nine day race covering 100 mile each day. I retired from cycling in 1996 after breaking the hour record and decided I wanted to emulate my brother Kenny who had won a big biathlon up in Scotland called the Highland Cross, which is a 20 mile hilly run and a 30 mile cycle. I finished the run in first place and because I only retired from cycling six months earlier, I was hoping no one would catch me on the bike and luckily for me they didn't, so I won that as well. Then nine years ago, some severe things started happening to my body. I lost almost three stone in the sp space of eight weeks. Constantly going to the toilet, had a severe thirst, and I had blurred vision. My wife, Lynn, who was heavily pregnant with her youngest boy, Finley, got very worried about this, because she was worried about being heavily pregnant, but also all this weight loss. So she went online, <coughs> did a bit of research, and looked like it could be type 1 diabetes. So she got a home self-testing kit. That arrived on the Monday, did the test, and it looked like, yep, you've got type 1 diabetes. I had a dilemma. I had a ticket for the UEFA Cup final down in Manchester <laughs> on the Wednesday that week, and I knew that if I went to the doctor, there's no way he would let me go to the UEFA Cup final. So I decided to wing it and <laughs> go down to the game with my mate Stevie, he said, I'll drive down, we'll watch the game. And this is from Inverness, so it's a long way. We'll watch the game. Didn't enjoy the game, not because Rangers got beat. I just didn't enjoy it because I was lethargic, tired. Got in the car to drive home back up to Inverness after the game. It started raining, and with my blurred vision, the oncoming cars, poor Stevie had to drive all the way back up to Inverness as well. Went to the doctor the next day. Doctor sent me straight to Rigmore Hospital and... From then, I, I was on multi-daily injections until I went on an insulin pump on 2012. This is the week I was diagnosed. You can see our youngest boy, Finley, was born that week as well. And you can see that I'm pretty skin and bone. Folk were coming into our bike shop saying, you're looking really fit. You must be doing lots of training. But it was actually the very opposite because I couldn't do any training because I was so lethargic. So in 2013... When I was diagnosed, as she'd have said, I knew absolutely hee-haw about the condition. That really embarrassed me because I thought, I've raced all over the world with Scotland and Great Britain. If I know nothing about type 1 diabetes, the chances are the majority of other folk don't know. So I decided I wanted to do something to raise awareness. So I put on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, looking for something to raise awareness, but also raise money at the same time, which I actually, leading up to the marathon Sabla, I raised £26,000, split between JDRF and Diabetes UK. When I put it on social media, my uh, physio got back to me and he said, Marathon de Sabla. And I went, hmm, I've heard of that, because I knew someone that had done it, and he said he would only recommend it to folk that he absolutely hated. So I thought, well, <laughs> if he's saying that, it, it must be pretty brutal. So I got in touch with the organisation. There's normally a three-year waiting list. I told them about me being an ex-international cyclist diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and I wanted to raise money and awareness. So they said to me, give me your email address and we'll get back to you in the next few weeks. Next day I got an email from them, you're in. We've managed to get you into next year's race. So I'm like, you dancer. So I got back to David Brandy, my physio, and I said, you're not going to believe it, Dave, but I've got into next year's race. And he went, you bloody idiot. I was only joking about the marathon to start with. <laughs> I was quite happy because I knew it was going to be tough and it was going to raise lots of awareness for the condition. 
This is uh, who I shared my bivouac with. Your bivouac is basically your all-inclusive accommodation for the week, and it's just a rug in the, the, the ground with two poles and a tarpaulin. We call ourselves the Tartan Army. We're, we're all Scottish bar the guy number 665 in the middle. He's actually a Michelin star chef in London. We actually had him singing Flower of Scotland by the end of the week. <laughs> so you're self-sufficient for the whole race, which means that you've got to carry all your own food, medication and everything. So I thought I'd be smart. I thought, seeing I'm not having to carry my first day's breakfast, I'll really treat myself. So I had a tin of ambrosia creamed rice. What a mistake. <laughs> because I'd not had that before. So it threw my blood glucose levels all over the place. So when everyone's on the start line off the Marathon of Saba, everyone's worried about the race. All I'm worried about is doing blood tests to calibrate my CGM and get my blood glucose levels under control before the race started. My biggest fear before going was blisters, because blisters get infected, you know, you can get problems there. I ended up with two tiny blisters under the balls of my feet. Because the organizers recommend that you go between one to two size bigger in your shoes, the slight movement of the, the shoes just caused two tiny blisters. This is your view from your all-inclusive accommodation, cracking sunsets and uh, sunrises in the morning. Stage two was an uh, absolutely brutal uh, stage. You can see that I'm not actually last in the race. There was quite a snake behind me. Um, it was the shortest stage. It was only 19 miles long. <coughs> I had a vertical before I went to Marathon Sabla. During the hilly stage, you had to go across that pretty savage ridge. If the finish line was at the other end, I would have just turned back. That's the drop off of the ridge. It makes my knees wobble. The final ascent of the day, the bottom of it was 25% and the top of it was 50%, which is one and two. They actually, the organizers bolted it open to help you get up the final part. Although it was the shorter stage and the hilliest stage, I actually managed to control my blood glucose levels when I downloaded the CGM after, almost between within a person without diabetes. I was between 3.7 and 6.3. This is Derek. Uh, Derek was the hypochondriac in our bivouac. <laughs> there was always something wrong with Derek. He actually looked a bit like a mummy by the end of the race because he had bandages all over him. <laughs> Top guy, but uh, yeah, he's uh, a bit of a hypochondriac. <coughs> so if you finish, uh, sorry, before the, the longest stage, which is a 48 mile stage, stage four, I decided to treat myself to a fresh top, fresh running shorts and fresh socks. And walking to the start line that day, it looked like I was the only one that treated myself because I looked a bit like a welder's flash compared to everyone else <laughs> in their minging clothes. So during the longest stage, for three hours that day, it was 52 degrees, so pretty hot. So when you're doing a stage that long and you look down and you see your shadow like that, I actually thought it was Darth Vader. We were told, because it was going to be the hottest stage, it, to try and run it with folk that were s similar ability. So I did it with our adopted Scotsman, Steve, behind us, and Andy behind him. We'd run the whole stage together. If you finish the 48-mile stage in one day, you get the next day as a rest day, which for me was very strange because I used to do nine-day races, 100 mile a day on the bike, no rest days. I'd have sooner we just battered on and finished the final stage. Give me a chance to fit fresh cannula and redo insulin and things. This was Angela. This is not my feet, don't worry. This was a girl in the bivouac next to her. This is Angela, a, an absolute trooper. That was her other foot. She had to get carried to the, final, the start of the final stage because her feet were in such a mess. But when you actually start the stage, things like blisters are the least of your worries. So she actually finished the final 26.2 mile stage. As I say, she's an absolute trooper. I was allocated one email to send a day, but could receive numerous emails. And because I raised 26,000 between JDRF and Diabetes UK, they, my, I sent my email to my brother. He was putting it on Twitter and Facebook. They were retweeting it and reposting it. So it was going all over the world. One particular email still sticks in my mind, and that's from 2013, from a family of a girl, a 13-year-old girl in America, saying that what I was doing 
was changing their attitude and they were going to allow their 13-year-old daughter to have a sleepover. So when things were tough, it just put blinkers on you and made you charge on. Six o'clock every day, uh, the bivouac labellers come along and uh, take away your, your roof and uh, that's what you're left with, your magic carpet, sort your food out for the day. That's not pee in the front, by the way. <laughs> My other biggest fear before going was toilets. I'm very much a homeboy toilet person. <laughs> so I was quite concerned about the toilets before going, but the toilets were actually quite a delight. They were the, th the things at the back, the white things there, and all it was was a seat with the, um, they fitted a toilet seat on it. They gave you a load of brown bags. You put your brown bag, did your business, and off you went. So my second biggest fear didn't turn out to be a fear. Friday's final marathon stage, all went well. That's me. Because I had an animus pump, I could press the button and see what my CGM blunt, uh, arrows were doing. Everything went well. The only time I actually had a hypo was halfway through the 48-mile stage. And then with about five miles to go in the last stage as well, I had another wee hypo. But just, I actually sorted them out before the CGM alerted me. I could feel it. That's me with my medal and the uh, insulin pump at the end. What did I learn about the Marathon Slabba? I learned that you can't go down to Holfords and buy a Hayes manual <laughs> on type 1 diabetes. Because although I had the same food every single day, apart from rosy or creamed rice, I had the same sleep pattern every day, and the distance, except for the 48-mile stage, were basically the same. My insulin requirements changed every day. I was having to do insulin requirement changes on the move all the time. And in this back here, in a normal day, I'm between 36, 40 units a day. During the Marath Marathon Sabla, I was t total daily of 9 to 12 units of insulin a day. So the Tartan army decided, right, we'll have a reunion. Let's go for a meal and a few beers. But no, Tartan army don't do it simple. You've got to run a 53-mile ultra marathon before it. <laughs> Called the Highland Fling in the West Highland Way in Scotland from Milne Guy to Tyndrum. 18 miles into the Highland Fling, I felt something loose around my stomach, and it was my biggest fear. My cannula had ripped out for my insulin pump. Still 35 miles to do. What do I do? Do I run the last 35 miles without any carbohydrate? So I decided to wing it and give it a bash. I finished it, and I finished actually quite strong. There was 1,050 competitors in it, and I finished 173rd, running the last 35 miles solely on water. This next uh, slide that I'll show you is the CGM reading from the day. We stayed with our hypochondriac Derek down in Glasgow the <laughs> night before. He cooked homemade lasagna and then sticky toffee pudding, which is normally something I wouldn't eat. So I went to bed quite high. We got up at four o'clock in the morning, had porridge, which put me up a wee bit higher. And then on the way to the race, all I'm worried about is trying to get my blood glucose level under control. So you can see the night before, I don't like seeing double figures. For me to be seeing things like 15s is scary. Up at four o'clock in the morning, porridge, up above 20, and on the way to the race, which started at 6, I'm just trying to control my blood glucose level and get them where I like to be, which is within the green. My cannula came off at 9 o'clock in the morning, and I finished the race just up before 6 o'clock. So you can see I ran the majority of the race solely in water within a person without type 1 diabetes range. And I did that controlling my blood glucose level with the short, intense sprint, if I see my blood glucose level going up. And that... They, made it slightly go higher. If I seen them going up too high, I took the foot off the gas. As soon as I finished, because I'd not had insulin for the majority of the day, I had a major spike until I, I managed to get a fresh cannula fitted and then got it under control, maybe a wee bit too much. <laughs> I always liked to have a go. So um, in 2015, I decided I would do the 72 mile Great Glen Ultra, which is from Fort William to Inverness, my hometown. So I was running home all the time. It had 7,000 feet of climbing. And with 20 miles to go, my CGM, because it had rained all night, my CGM sensor came off. Then I got my blood glucose meter out, put test strips in. They were too wet to read, so I had to run the last 20 miles completely blind, not having a clue what my blood glucose levels were. Managed to get them OK because I, I finished OK. I actually finished third in the race. 
then two, two years, no, sorry, last year it was, I decided because I'd done the hot ultra, it was obvious to do a cold ultra. So I entered a 350 mile race in the Yukon in Canada called the 663 Ultra Marathon. You arrive there six days before the race to make sure that all your bags of compulsory kit and everything arrive. The bag with my compulsory kit didn't arrive even in the day that the competitors drove the 600 mile up to the start at the Eagle Plains. So I had to wait until the evening flight. Bag finally arrived, so leading up to the race, I wasn't sleeping very well. Sleep deprivation, just will worry with the bag and things. So as I say, the race was 352 miles, and it's from Eagle Plains to, it's TAC, that's the abbreviation for it. I'm not <laughs> going to try and pronounce it. Tuck to tuck tuck or something like that. So you're self-sufficient for the race, so you tow a sledge with wheels, which is called a pulk. After day one, uh, although there was only 13 competitors in it, I was lying in second place. Things were going well. Uh, this section is renowned for blowing the ice road truckers that they trucks over in the high winds, and the day I went up, it was nearly blowing me off the road. It was pretty, pretty savage. Day, uh, end of day two, um, I was with PJ, who eventually finished second, and with about 15 miles to go to the checkpoint, he said, I'm absolutely shattered. I'm going to have to get into my bivvy bag and have a sleep. I'd done my race head on, and I thought, it's only 15 miles, I'm going to charge on. Then I started hallucinating and convinced I was on the wrong road. There is only one road from Eagle Plains to Tuck. But because of the hallucinations, I was convinced I was on the wrong road. So I started going up and down the road. So rather than doing 70 miles that day, I actually ended up doing 96 miles. I had a spot tracker so folk back home could watch my progress. And my wife was watching me going up and down this road, <laughs> convinced I was having a hypo. Now, that was quite a fear, because if you have hallucinations and then throw a hypo into the melting pot, that's got danger, danger written all over it. Luckily for me... I didn't have any real severe hypos during the race. The day after that, that that's food wrapped down my thing. That's just to get the food warm. That's not my belly, by the way. <laughs> day two of hallucinations were just wacky. Johnny the medic came out because uh, he was concerned that I wasn't getting to the checkpoint quick enough. I was convinced Johnny was the head of SES recruitment <laughs> and he was putting me through my final part of SES training. I then phoned the MOD twice, I didn't have a phone, but I phoned the MOD twice <laughs> to say it wasn't a safe environment and because there was uh, mine bombs on the road. Then two of my friends <coughs> from Inverness, Ross and Ewan MacDonald, have invented these things in the UK that they put at bus stops so folk waiting for their bus can do their exercise on a treadmill and then when their bus comes along they hop off and get on. They haven't, but this was going through my head. <laughs> And they've gone and exported all these treadmills to the Yukon in Canada and put them in this stretch of road I'm on. And I'm on these treadmills getting absolutely nowhere. And I'm convinced it's the same tree on my right-hand side that's there. I'm shouting at swearing at Ross and Ewan to switch these treadmills off. And they wouldn't switch them off. It took me something like four hours to do the last 4K that day just with the severe hallucinations. The next day, um, the day after hallucinations, 10 miles in, I had already drunk three, three litres out of my camelback bladder, so went into my pulk, got my f big flasks out, filled my, my camelback bladder, put the top on, put it back in my backpack, put my backpack back on, hadn't put the top on properly. Three litres of fluid poured over me. It's minus 40 degrees, and this has, again, got danger written all over it. Luckily for me, one of the organisers pulled up just as this has happened, if he hadn't, the chances are I wouldn't be standing here in front of you today. I'd probably have frozen to death. He said, right, what are we going to do? We'll have to get you back to the checkpoint, dry all your clothes, take you back here, mark where you were. So that was another few hours lost. So th things weren't going my way as far as time, wa time was with all the hallucinations and my own errors. Biggest mistake for me, I was the only one in the race with a two-wheeled pulk. The two-wheeled pulk bobbed. And because I had a waist harness, the, the, that caused severe back trouble for me. Eventually got to the 120, final 120 miles, which is on the frozen Mackenzie River. 
the famous ice road. I was falling quite severely behind the pack by this point. I'd pretty much made my mind up with 80 miles to go in the race that I was going to have to pull a pin. My back was killing me. My feet were in quite a mess with blisters, but time wasn't really on my side. So I pretty much on the ice road made my mind up that I'm not going to finish. I need to go back next year, which is five weeks ago, and finish unfinished business. The organiser of the race put this really nice message up uh, on the, the 6633 Facebook page the day that I actually retired from the race, which gave me a bit of hope for the next year as well. Christmas Day this year, I went out for a seven mile run and with about 200 metres to go from the house, went over my left ankle and ended up in A&E. &E. The doctor came through, had a look at it, and she went, that doesn't look very good. I'm sat there, I'm going to the Arctic in six weeks' time. If this is broken, I'm going to be in plaster. I won't be going to the Arctic in six weeks' time. Luckily for me, it was just ligament damage. I had my physio, the one that recommended Marathon Sabla, David Brandy, come round. He had a good look at it and said, you should be okay. You can put weight on it. Although it's sore, you should still be okay to, to take part. So 2017, six weeks ago, six weeks ago yesterday, I was on the start line to try and finish unfinished business. Re main reason was I let myself down. I let my family down. I let my friends down. But more importantly, I felt I let the whole world diabetes community down by not finishing in 2016. So I was on the start line six weeks ago. A lot more respect for the race, better prepared, better trained, and more importantly, I decided to go sensible and go for the four-wheeled pulp with a full upper body harness. Northern lights at night are absolutely spectacular. So you've been on your feet for a long time, then you see things like this and it just gives you a new release of energy. When I got to the last 150 miles, after leaving Greg, I left Greg at about 200 miles, and then I left David, uh, who they were both starting to struggle. David actually pulled out with 150 miles to go. I did the last 150 miles completely solo. My backup insulin, which was wrapped in a down jacket inside my pulk, completely froze. So when I needed to redo my insulin three, three and a half days in, I had to put it in warm water to defrost the insulin so that I could get it into my pump. My CGM, um, two days before actually heading up north, the 500, 600 mile drive to, to the thingy planes, the, the reader stopped working. So I had to use the app on my phone with four days left of the race, sorry, three days left of the race. My phone then packed in, so I didn't have any CGM. So I had to get old school, three pairs of gloves off, try to get blood out of cold fingers, not ideal, then get the test strips out, put them in the, the meter. They wouldn't read because the test strips were so cold. So I had to put them down my private parts to warm them up <laughs> for 20 minutes and then take the test strips back out and uh, so I could do blood glucose tests. And I had to do the last 150 miles old school by doing that every few hours, every three hours I probably tested. There was a Japanese film crew there and they're going to be releasing a one and a half, uh, hour and a half documentary on it. So got a fair bit of uh, publicity for type 1 diabetes. On the ice road, I got interviewed for a live a Canadian TV as well. So it's all good for raising awareness for type 1 diabetes. With 50 miles to go, um, the leader, Tibby, who'd won the race the previous year, I was only a mile and a half behind him at one point, although he was at the checkpoint. I got to that checkpoint and he was still there and I was like, what a shock to see Tibby here. I was lying in second place and there was 24 folk in the race this year. So I was quite shocked with 50 mile to go to be lying in second place in the same place as Tibby. You can see it's pretty cold. <coughs> I told you about the previous hallucinations. This year with three miles to go, I had minor hallucinations. 
the snowbanks at the side started to look like people putting their hands out begging. And uh, there was a hole in the road, a massive big hole in my left-hand side that if I was to slow down, I would fall in that hole. There wasn't, but this the hallucinations. So Martin, the organiser, came out and he said to me, there's only five kilometres to go, three mile already. And I'm like, feeling really dehydrated. And because of the mistakes I made the year before, I thought, I'm not going to risk six hours going up and down this road with hallucinations. So I stopped, went into my pulp, got my flasks out, got energy drink out, made an energy drink, drank it. By the time I put, popped everything back in the pulp and clipped the harness and everything back on, the snowbanks were back to being snowbanks and the hole had gone. So for the sake of 10 minutes and listening to my body and just doing things correctly rather than rushing things by the camelback top not on properly, for the sake of 10 minutes, the hallucinations left me and that, they were the only hallucinations I had in the whole race and that was three miles to go to the finish line. The finish straight was really emotional for me. Um, when I went to the Commonwealth Games, I had a really close friend who was like a brother to myself and my brother. He was our manager, Alan Hewitt. He lost his fight for cancer uh, just a few years ago. So Alan used to carry a Buddha about with him and rub its head all the time. So I've had a bit of a fetish for Buddha since then. So I, my wife bought me a big brass Buddha, which I carried. And going up the finishing straight, I took the Buddha out, which was the worst thing I did, and rubbed its head and looked up. <coughs> and I said to Alan, thanks very much, Alan, for helping me get through this. And I cried my whole way up the finish straight like a baby. Just the emotions of Alan being there with me and just the fact that I'd finished the race for the for me, for my family, and the uh, friends, and for for everybody. There's me holding the Buddha, trying to hold the tears in there. I managed to get the tears to stop just before crossing the finish line. Crossed the finish line, and the Japanese film crew asked me what the Buddha was all about. Well, <laughs> you all know what's coming next. So it took, you've got eight days to complete the race. I did it in six days, 21 hours, finished in second place, got the fourth fastest time in the history of the race, first Scotsman to finish the beast of a race. Oh. Had quite a blister. Th th that's only five weeks ago. The race started six weeks ago. That was only five weeks ago. That is completely healed. I was at my clinic because they wanted to check my feet and they... Uh, they said, sorry, I'll get rid of that slide. It's upsetting you. <laughs> <laughs> so my diabetes clinic said to me that I'd healed probably quicker than someone without type 1 diabetes. Had frost nip in the end of my fingers. I lost all the skin. That's all healed. That's only five weeks ago. That's my story. Thanks very much for listening.